All right, so I'll be talking about quantum property testing, and this is joint work with Sebastian Bubeck and Jerry Lee. I'm going to begin with a brief crash course on some basic ideas from quantum property testing uh, targeted to an audience that may not necessarily have any background in quantum. Um, so let's just start with the sort of classical setup. Okay, so in classical distribution testing or learning, we're interested in probability distributions over a finite collection of elements, say of size d. Um, and this distribution is going to be specified by some vector p of marginals, um, and p lives on the simplex. In other words, uh, p consists of d numbers uh, that are all non-negative and sum up to 1. Okay? And a measurement from a distribution um, is simply some number uh, corresponding to a sample y from 1 to d, where that sample equals some element x with probability corresponding to the uh, marginal piece of x. Okay, uh, so that's the classical setup. Um, what happens in the quantum picture? So the quantum analog of a distribution is a mixed state. Um, this is some d by d Hermitian matrix um, that lives in the spectrohedron. Um, that is, all of the constraints that applied to the vector p in the classical setup now apply to the eigenvalues of this Hermitian matrix rho. So in particular, rho is going to be PSD and trace one. Okay, so what is the quantum analog of measuring, uh, measurements or samples from a distribution? Uh, this turns out to be a bit more complicated. Okay, so what does it mean to measure a mixed state? Um, to do so, one typically specifies a collection of d by d measurement matrices, m sub one to m sub little m, such that all of the matrices are PSD, and furthermore, they sum up to the identity. Okay. So such a collection of matrices is called a positive operator valued measurement, or a POVM for short. Um, and how do these matrices translate to a probability distribution over measurement outcomes? Well, the outcome of measuring mixed state rho using this POVM um, uh, is going to take on the value x um, from 1 to little m with probability q sub x given by the trace inner product of my mixed state rho with the corresponding POVM element m sub x. Okay? So just as a sanity check, since m sub x and rho are both PSD, q sub x, defined to be the trace inner product of these matrices, is going to be non-negative. And furthermore, because the m sub x is summed to identity, it's not hard to see that this defines a valid distribution over measurement outcomes. Okay? Sum of q sub x's is equal to the sum of the trace inner products. We can bring the sum inside and use the fact that the m sub x is sum to the identity together with the fact that rho is trace one to conclude that the sum of the qx's is one. Okay, so um, one can immediately see that this formalism already captures uh, the classical notion of sampling from a probability distribution p. Namely, given such a distribution p, you can form a mixed state rho, which is just uh, given by embedding p on the diagonal of rho and measuring rho in the POVM specified by the standard basis. Namely, uh, E sub one to E sub D are the standard basis vectors and E on E1 transpose to E D, E D transpose are the projectors in those directions. Okay, and this immediately recovers classical sampling. Okay, um, and so what is uh, the notion of closeness that we're gonna use between two mixed states? Um, so classically, a standard measure uh, of closeness is just uh, the TV distance between two distributions. And the natural quantum analog of this is the so-called trace distance. Okay, so this is just the Shatten one norm or nuclear norm uh, of the difference between the two given mixed states, uh, rho and gamma. Okay, so that's our measure of distance between quantum states. Um, and now let's recall what happens in the distribution testing setup. Okay, so in the classical setup, we're given capital N samples from an unknown distribution P, and we'd like to infer some property of P. This could be the property of uniformity, for instance, uh, testing if P is equal to the uniform distribution over D elements or epsilon far from it in TV. Or this could be the more general question of identity testing, namely testing if P is exactly equal to a given distribution Q or epsilon far in TV. Okay. And um, so the list of possible tasks, um, uh, the possible properties that P could satisfy um, uh, is quite extensive, but we'll really focus on uniformity and identity testing in this talk. Okay, so in general, the hope in distribution testing is that you can achieve all of this um, using capital N samples um, that is much less than the number of samples it would take to actually learn the full distribution P. Okay? So uh, 
you know, it's folklore that you can learn a distribution P in TV uh, to TV epsilon using roughly D over epsilon squared samples. And the hope is that you can test these kinds of properties using much fewer samples. Okay, so what do we see in the quantum picture? Um, in this case, instead of getting samples from an unknown distribution P, we get copies of an unknown mixed state rho. And we like to infer some property of rho. The quantum analog of uniformity testing is so-called mixedness testing. Um, namely, test if rho is exactly equal to the maximally mixed state, uh, which I'll denote by rho mm. Um, and this is defined to be uh, a scaling of the identity matrix. Okay. We want to test if rho is equal to this or epsilon far in trace distance. The quantum analog of identity testing is so-called state certification. Namely, test if rho is exactly e equal to a given state gamma or epsilon far in trace norm. Okay. And we can define corresponding analogs for a variety of other classical distribution testing tasks that I won't get into details about in this talk. Okay, and so analogously, um, in the quantum setting, the hope is that we can do these kinds of uh, quantum property testing tasks um, in much fewer copies than it takes to actually learn the full state row. And just by you know, parameter counting, we would expect the answer to scale quadratically in D, because row is a D by D matrix. And indeed, in um, recent work by Ha et al. and O'Donnell and Wright, it was shown that uh, D squared over epsilon squared is the optimal copy complexity for learning a quantum state. Okay, so the question really is, uh, can you hope to do better than d squared over epsilon squared uh, when it comes to property testing? Okay, and so just as a general question, you know, why do we care about quantum property testing um, as I've defined it? Um, from a mathematical standpoint, this is a natural, you know, non-commutative analog of distribution testing. And from a more practical standpoint, um, uh, it's particularly timely to begin to ask these kinds of questions of whether we can certify whether the quantum states that we prepare in the lab uh, actually satisfy the properties we want them to. Okay. Um, okay. So with that in mind, um, let's let's go to one of the key subtleties um, that manifests in the quantum setup and not in the classical. And this is the notion of adaptivity. Okay. Um, so the key difference between the classical and the quantum testing pictures <laughs> is that in the latter you can actually vary the choice of POVM that specifies how you interact with your underlying object, uh, in this case, uh, your mixed state row. Okay, so you know the, the most naive thing you could do is you could fix a collection of capital N POVMs, one for each copy of row, ahead of time. Um, and these POVMs could be different, but in particular, you choose them in a non-adaptive fashion. And so this is what we call uh, non-adaptive uh, non unentangled measurements. On the other hand, you could also be a bit more clever and choose the POVMs um, based on um, sort of your history of interaction with row. In other words, um, at a given time step, um, for a given copy of row, I could choose how uh, I measure row um, based on the outcomes of the measurements I've seen so far. Okay, so this adaptive fashion of picking POVMs is what we call adaptive unentangled measurements. Okay, but we could do much more. Um, Imagine that uh, you know, you're given these n copies of row. Instead of thinking of them as things to be measured in, in succession, you can regard row as just a larger mixed state that lives in this bigger tensored space. In particular, row to the tensor n is now some Hermitian matrix that lives in d to the n by d to the n. And instead of individually applying POVMs for each copy of row, we can just apply a single huge POVM to the joint state row to the tensor n. Um, and such a measurement is, entangle, is, is called entangled. And in particular, um, entangled measurements uh, strictly subsume adaptive measurements, um, which of course uh, subsume non-adaptive measurements. And the key question is, can we show separations between these families of measurements in the context of quantum testing and learning um, setups? Okay. All right, so this is the driving question behind, behind this talk. Um, so before I go into uh, what we show about this question, Let's talk a bit about prior work. Okay, so um, in terms of previous results, uh, essentially all the uh, known results focus on the entangled measurement setup. And in fact, uh, as was shown by O'Donnell and Wright in earlier work, um, when you have entangled measurements, d over epsilon squared copies are both necessary and sufficient for the question of quantum mixedness testing. And recently, um, Badescu, O'Donnell, and Wright actually showed that for the more general question of quantum state certification, 
d over epsilon squared is also the right answer in terms of copy complexity when you have entangled measurements. Okay. Um, as for unentangled measurements, um, the best algorithm known for mixes testing uh, was essentially the unentangled learning algorithm um, of Quang et al., which required copy complexity roughly d cubed over epsilon squared. Okay, so there seems to be a big gap uh, in the state of knowledge um, regarding what we can do with entangled measurements versus what we can do with unentangled. Why I care about this distinction? Well, from a practical standpoint, entangled measurements uh, incur this huge quantum memory overhead of having to simultaneously maintain all copies of rho um, coherently. Okay. On the other hand, with unentangled measurements, you can perform them in a streaming fashion. You only need one copy of rho at a time to be prepared, and this is you know, widely believed to be you know, what we can actually hope to achieve in practice. Okay. So while entangled measurements are a very mathematically interesting model for understanding how in idealized setups we can interact with the underlying mixed state, unentangled measurements are sort of the, um, the practical stand for, standard that we can hope to shoot for. Okay? And this leads to the natural question, uh, can I basically do everything that Badescu, O'Donnell, and Wright showed we could do for uh, quantum property testing with entangled measurements using unentangled measurements? In other words, is entanglement necessary for optimal quantum property testing? And this work will instantiate this question in the specific setup of mixedness testing. So can we test mixedness of a given um, mixed state um, using O of D over epsilon squared copies, uh, but only using adaptive or non-adaptive measurements? And unfortunately, in this work, we show uh, that this, this question, um, uh, the answer to this question is no. Okay. All right, so what do we show? We show that um, when it comes to unentangled and non-adaptive uh, measurements, uh, d to the 3 halves over epsilon squared is necessary and sufficient for mixing this testing. Okay. And our main result is to show that if we work with more general unentangled adaptive measurements, um, there is a lower bound of at least d to the 4 thirds over epsilon squared. So first of all, this resolves an open question uh, that was asked by Wright regarding the complexity of testing mixedness using adaptive measurements. Um, and you know, just as an obvious observation, because mixedness testing is a special case of state certification, lower bounds for mixedness testing immediately apply to uh, give lower bounds for state certification. And to our knowledge, this is the first separation between entangled measurements and general adaptive unentangled measurements to date for any quantum testing or learning problem. Okay, I'll, I'll primarily focus on the lower bound um, of the second theorem, but let me just mention that for the upper bound of d to the 3 halves, um, you can achieve this with a very simple algorithm, namely measure in a Haar random basis um, the resulting distribution over d outcomes is epsilon over d far in L2 from the uniform distribution over d uh, with high probability. You can show this uh, by standard Weingarten calculations. Um, and once you have that, you can just run the classical L L2 tester for uniformity on P. Um, and this gives you the D to the three half scaling. Okay, so I want to focus now for the rest of the talk on the lower bound. Um, so let me first define the construction that we'll consider. Uh, to understand this, we need to revisit the classical setup. Um, so Paninsky's famous root D over epsilon squared lower bound for uniformity testing um, was uh, shown as follows. Specifically, he showed that it's hard to distinguish between the following two scenarios. The first is the null hypothesis that all of your n draws came from just the uniform distribution on d elements. And the second scenario is that all of your n draws came from some random perturbation of the uniform distribution. Okay, so formally, what is this random perturbation? Let's just assume for simplicity that d is even. Um, this family of random perturbations is, is going to be specified by the collection of bit strings of length d over 2. Um, so for a given bit string z, uh, the marginal at element x is going to be defined to be the following perturbation of the marginal for the uniform distribution uh, by, a, by a magnitude of epsilon over d. Okay, so it's easier to see this in pictures. Um, let's say z is given by this sequence of plus minus ones at the bottom then the resulting distribution um, over uh, uh, 14 elements is going to be given by the following. So for every block, um, for every coordinate of z, that's going to correspond to two adjacent uh, coordinates 
um, from 1 to 14. And uh, if that block uh, z happens to be plus 1, then the marginal for the left element is going to be slightly bigger than 1 over d, and the element for the right element, uh, sorry, the, the probability for the right element is going to be slightly less than 1 over d, um, and vice versa for uh, blocks for which z is negative 1. Okay, so this is the famous, you know, Paninsky uh, lower bound instance. Um, and, you know, the crux of his argument is to show that, uh, you know, this, uh, for these two distributions, P0 and P1, where P0 is the distribution over n samples from the uniform distribution, and P1 is the distribution of n samples from P sub z, where z is uniformly drawn from bit strings of length d over 2, that the TV between P0 and P1 is little o of 1, as long as the number of samples you draw is less than root d over epsilon squared. Okay? So you can think of A as really just um, some, some product measure, and B as some mixture of product measures, where the mixture uh, components correspond to the different possible bit strings z. And how does Paninsky upper bound uh, the TV between P0 and P1? He does so through uh, upper bounding via the chi-square divergence. Um, so why the chi-square divergence? This quantity has a lot of nice cancellations that arise because um, conditioned on z, p0 and p1 are both product distributions. Um, and this sometimes goes by the name of the inkster cislina method. Okay. Um, so how do we lift this to the quantum setting? Um, so there's a natural quantum Paninsky instance that's been considered previously in the literature, um, even by O'Donnell and Wright when they showed their d over epsilon squared lower bound for entangled measurements. Okay, so we start with an arbitrary Paninsky instance. It doesn't really matter which z we, we pick. Um, okay, let's just pick one and embed it onto the diagonal of a mixed state. Okay, so what I've denoted here is just the diagonal matrix whose diagonal entries are given by the marginals of p sub z. And now let me rotate that mixed state by a uniformly random uni unitary matrix u. And I'll define uh, the element from this quantum Paninsky mixture to be rho sub u. Okay, and now the mixture is parametrized not by z, but by the Haar random rotation u. And now the analog of uh, sort of the mathematical statement that you want to show now um, in the quantum uh, setup is as follows. I want to show that the TV between p0 and p1 is small, as long as the number of copies I have is too small. Where p0 now is defined to be the distribution over measurement outcomes um, for the whatever POVMs I end up choosing um, to measure my copies of the maximally mixed state with. And P1 is the distribution over outcomes if I instead measured um, rho sub u for a Haar random u. Okay. Um, and when the measurements are not adaptive, then A and B are uh, distinguishing between them is really distinguishing between a product measure and a mixture of product measures. Um, and we can essentially emulate this inkster cislina method behind Paninsky's proof um, and get the desired lower bound. But the million dollar question is, what do you do when the measurements are adaptively chosen? In this case, we don't have this nice uh, product measure structure. Um, and in particular, this chi-square divergence between P1 and P0 doesn't have a nice form. Our key workaround to, uh, uh, to this issue is to instead uh, bound the KL between P1 and P0 and we do so using the chain rule. Okay? And this chain rule is going to really help us tame the power um, that adaptivity should provide to the tester. Okay, so now let me get into the, the heart of the heart of the matter, this chain rule calculation. So just as a review, um, for two probability distributions P and Q, we can always upper bound the TB in terms of the KL and the KL in terms of the chi squared. Okay? This is just Pinsker's and uh, uh, convexity argument. Okay, and now let's just recall the definitions of KL and chi-squared. Um, and, uh, you know, typically for these kinds of calculations, we like the chi-squared because it's, you know, an it's an expectation of a polynomial in the likelihood ratio. Um, but we're going to instead use KL because it satisfies a nice chain rule. So if we instantiate this chain rule in our setup, what do we get? So recall P1 and P0 are these distributions over capital N measurement outcomes. Well, I can rewrite the KL as a sum of expectations of conditional KLs. Um, specifically, for every time step t, I can look at the expectation over transcripts of my outcomes from 1 to t minus 1 
under the alternative hypothesis of the conditional KL of the TF measurement on outcome under my uh, uh, alternative hypothesis conditioned on my transcript X sub less than T and the corresponding conditional distribution under the null hypothesis, which I'll just denote uh, for brevity by unit. Okay. I, can, I can now upper bound this KL uh, by the chi squared. And after a bunch of generic calculations that are not specific to the quantum uh, picture, we end up with the following quantity. A sum over expectations, now over the transcripts under the null hypothesis of this product of the likelihood ratio and this expectation over har random independent u and u prime of the following two quantities. Okay, I won't formally define what these quantities are, but suffice to say that, uh, first of all, this capital psi quantity satisfies that its expectation under u and u prime is equal to the square likelihood ratio, whereas this phi quantity uh, roughly corresponds to how much a single measurement can help you distinguish between uh, two different um, uh, randomly chosen components from the mixture. Okay, so now let's try to control phi. Um, and this turns out to be the key technical step. In some sense, all we need to show is that this phi is very small with high probability. And of course, you should expect some kind of statement to be true because a single measurement should tell us very little. And the key quantitative result that you want to show is that phi actually has epsilon squared over d to the 3 halves sub-Gaussian fluctuations. Okay, so ignoring the sub gaussianity aspect, let's just imagine that uh, phi was upper bounded by this quantity determ deterministically. Okay, if we had that, well, let's go back to our original uh, chain rule inequality. And we can now bring out this epsilon squared over d to the 3 halves from the phi. We can recall that the expectation of this capital psi is the square likelihood ratio between p1 and p0 in the first t minus 1 time steps, which means we can rewrite this uh, expression in the expectation as uh, a likelihood ratio and use the fact that the expectation of the likelihood ratio should be 1 for each of these summands to conclude uh, an upper bound of number of summands times epsilon squared over d to the 3 halves. Okay? And so then we would be done. But in fact, this gives me a much stronger lower bound than what we could prove. We would actually get a d to the 3 halves over epsilon squared. OK, so what goes wrong? The issue is that we don't actually have deterministic bounds on phi. Um, and really dealing with these rare events where phi could actually be quite large, in the special case where u and u prime are very closely aligned, um, turns out to be the heart of the matter. Um, and this is, this is where we quantitatively lose. So instead, what we need to do is uh, carefully balance phi and psi. Um, I won't go into the details of this, but this ends up uh, contributing to the fact that we only get a d to the 4 thirds lower bound. And refining this further to avoid the balancing, I think, is a great open question. OK, so let me conclude by very quickly sketching the, the toy calculation that um, suggests this epsilon squared over d to the 3 half scaling for phi. So let's just do the second moment calculation. Um, and let's just consider a standard basis uh, POVM. In this case, uh, if I take A to be this uh, diagonal matrix whose entries are plus minus epsilons, then you can show that this phi quantity is exactly 1 over D times the inner product between the vector of diagonal entries of a rotation of A under U and a rotation of A under V. Okay, you can show using Weingarten calculus that uh, the correlation between the ith diagonal entry of A rotated by U and the jth diagonal entry is exactly this quantity, uh, which in the case where I equals J um, uh, is exactly uh, of the order epsilon squared over D. Okay, so now if we unpack expectation of phi squared with respect to U and V, uh, it turns out that the diagonal entries dominate. In particular, if you, if you just plug in the fact above, you end up getting that the second moment scales with epsilon to the fourth over d cubed. Okay? So in particular, we expect the answer to be epsilon squared over d to the three halves fluctuations, but it turns out you need much higher moment information to, to get this, uh, the fact that the fluctu fluctuations are sub-Gaussian, and this turns out to be much, much more difficult. Okay? So let me conclude with open questions. Um, the most obvious one is to close this four thirds versus three halves gap for adaptive. Um, and more generally, you can ask, you know, as I ramp up the amount of entanglement I have from one entanglement all the way to full entanglement, how does this uh, gap between d to 3 halves and d change? 
You can also ask uh, to show um, more refined lower bounds for state certification when rho comes with additional structure. Um, and more generally, this work really opens up um, uh, the possibility for showing other adaptive lower bounds for um, uh, quantum property testing and learning questions. Um, and in particular, the most interesting one would be to show that um, when it comes to quantum tomography, i.e. quantum learning, that uh, there is a separation between what you can do with adaptive versus entangled. Okay, so that's all I have. Um, uh, I look forward to taking any questions during the, the live session for, uh, for Fox. So thanks.